left. We better get to the studio. Hope we can make it. It's be so foggy around here. I know. It's so foggy. No sun at all. The weather is so awful and San Francisco was so gorgeous. What happened? We better get to the studio and do this garden show. But how can anything grow around here? Margarita Cardenas with Urban Traditions and we're back for another session and this time Urban Traditions went to Shell Dance Nursery in Pacifica and was enchanted. It was like stepping back into a pre prehistoric ambiance. That's what this place holds. It's like the nursery that time forgot. Uh, this nursery, I was kind of um, shocked because you know I didn't think the Pacifica or the orchids could live in uh, this cold climate because like most I also think that it's they're more native to the tropics um, but we have some cute little anecdotes about orchids and some questions from our fans for our expert Nancy Davis uh, Nancy Davis is the caretaker of Shell Dance Nursery. Hi, Nancy. Welcome. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, and it's delightful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you for coming, and thank you for in, uh, inviting me over. I, w I loved it. I love oh, to look at those beautiful orchids. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us, how does Shell Dance come to be? Well, um, way back in 1976, uh, we kind of came from, my husband and I came from Florida out here to San Francisco uh, to help his brother uh, in a new venture that Bruce had come up with. He was into or inspired by Carmen Miranda because his roots were in Miami and that Miami scene. So Carmen Miranda and seashells from the seashore put the two together and uh, so we came up with a uh, plant business selling seashells and plants. So as time has gone by, we stopped doing seashells because of environmental reasons and just stayed with the plants. And uh, then Bruce went off to uh, have a haberdashery with Cuban cigars and I'm left with plants. So still plugging along. So do you have a, a horticulture background then? I have practical experience background, which has given me all green fingers, not only green thumbs. Great. Yeah, um, uh, now uh, you, you're associated with Golden Gate Park. Mm -hmm. How did the union come to be? Um, that was a wonderful uh, um, event that took place. Where our nursery is located was right in the path of a freeway planned from 280, there was this three-way, uh, th uh, no, 380 interchange, and we were right in the path of that. What they, uh, the developers wanted to do was connect uh, the 101 with Highway 1. Now, there's a lot of really beautiful um, open space there in between those two areas. So uh, a, a, a grassroots um, environmental effort came to be and communities came together and the end result was that all that part, uh, property was in, uh, included into the National Park Service. And we were um, invited to stay because we were our agriculture background and uh, we are now stewards of the park as well as park partners. Very proud of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there is wildlife that's endangered in that region, uh, uh, wildlife oh, and yes. plant we've species. Got the, we've got the San Francisco garter snake right here in our community. It's one of the, the most beautiful snake in the world. And it's right there in Pacifica. Um, we also have the uh, what is it the the ooh, what colored legs uh, the frogs that live that the, the it is a whole bunch of things that live there. Um, so you got the the uh, garter snake and frogs and plants and California poppies and um, irises. A lot of beauty in that area to see. It's subtle, 
but it's coastal environment that's very precious and important for um, the well-being of all of the, the area. So did Shell then have a history then of um, uh, having these orchids or endangering or did mm -hmm. they just come to, to be when you came along? Um, I think in order to do what we've been doing, you have a, definitely have to be plant crazy. Uh, so um, we, along the way, have acquired a lot of really interesting plants and uh, a lot of interesting stories, and uh, so it'll be good to compare some of yours with some of mine, and we'll see what we come up with. Well, I do love orchids, mm -hmm. but they don't seem to like me yeah. um, because, uh, um, uh, well, they're, uh, do they have to be in a controlled environment? Um, are they only good in the tropics? Because mm -hmm. our weather here is not very tropical. They're, orchids are the largest blooming plant family on the planet. That means that, just that statement means that anywhere that we go in the world, we will find an orchid. Oh. So there's a big range between uh, the tropicals where Tarzan grows and, or Tarzan lives and orchids grow. And uh, the high uh, cloud forest uh, to even the tundras, you're gonna find orchids. Wisconsin has orchids, you know. Oh my God. Yeah, so they're everywhere. Uh, so in all of those different uh, climates that they're adapted to, that means that one, at least one or two varieties are going to be happy in your home environment. Yeah. Oh. You just have to find the right one for your, for your living space. <clears throat> well, according to our sources, mm -hmm. there's over 25 varieties of orchids. And just how many orchids uh, do you have in uh, how, uh, what, how many species? You mean 25,000? 25,000. I oh thought my that's God, what really? you mean. Yeah, 25,000. 25, wow. That's just the named varieties, the ones that we have names for. That doesn't include the ones that um, we don't know about yet that are still out there uh, hiding in the jungles or hiding uh, on rocky cliffs. Um, what was the question now? <laughs> well, um, how many varieties do you have in, in, in the nursery then, if there's so many? Yeah. Uh, we have the basics. Uh, you could uh, pretty much say that there's maybe 10 different varieties. Uh, those are the genuses. And then in those genuses, like this one that's right, I don't know if the, you can see that now, but uh, this one is called um, a pansy orchid. I'll use the the botanical as well as the mm -hmm. uh, common name. So it's called a pansy orchid because it looks like a pansy. And then the one next to it is called a lady slipper plant. Uh, and this is a paphiopetalum, and this one's uh, Miltoniopsis. Uh, those are two groups of plants. Now within those, just those two groups, you're gonna get a lot of variety. So one could, if you had a cool, shady, home that was real breezy, both of these plants would love you. Mm. So you already have half your work done. Whereas, uh, say, one of the Phalaenopsis or moth orchids, they come from that real warm environment, so they're not going to want that cool, shady uh, in, uh, home. So if it, your home is cool, go for this variety. If your home is warm, go for one of the other warm loving varieties. Then, as I say, you're really going to have, chances are you're going to have success. There's, right. a few, there's a few other things that they need, but if you start with that as your, your premise to, to acquire an orchid, then that's your, your best uh, bet for having success. Yeah, so, oh, okay, so mm -hmm. it's really upon the personality of the orchid, and then you, you will it. have a success. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, Shell does, uh, does not only have specialized in orchids, mm -hmm. they also have bromeliads yep. and, and other exotic plants. Mm -hmm. And um, I love bromeliads. Now, Me what? Too. They're gorgeous, yep. but um, I'm kind of leery because are they hard to take care of? Are, are they, will they, they look kind of hardy, yeah. but... Um, no, bromeliads are wonderful. They've just got huge personalities. They have a different kind of 
culture that maybe you can invite me back at another time and I can tell you all about, we could do a show and tell on, on bromeliads because they really do have, again, like orchids, a wide variety, uh, a large range, and then a lot of interesting things in between all those different ranges. Uh, you can grow them inside or outside oh. in your garden, so it's not just a plant for the Bay Area that would do well for uh, um, an inside plant. Orchids also, you may not know, uh, can be grown outside here in the Bay Area. So they're not just a plant for a house. They can also be incorporated into gardens uh, with huge success. Oh, yes, because, um, well, your, your, your nursery is, is more of a controlled climate, so but some of those can live out. Oh, sometimes my nursery is a hit and miss. <laughs> okay. We're so old fashioned. The greenhouses, I think you'll probably ask me about history later, but they've been around for a long time. So we're, we're real bare basic bones, you know. <laughs> well, there's a history of that they're also edible, isn't it? And uh, um, I'm talking particularly of about the uh, vanilla, vanilla orchid, yes, and mm -hmm. uh, way back it was uh, the Mayans or the Aztecs. Mm -hmm. uh, they believed that they would eat the um, uh, vanilla orchid drink, actually drink or vanilla orchid with chocolate, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. that would uh, empower them and make them healthy. Um, and the, the Chinese also believe that um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, that uh, um, it's. Uh, for uh, lung diseases and cough. Mm -hmm. Now, is that true, or is that just a little folk tale that? Um... Oh, I love those folk tales. <laughs> well, we'll go with the vanilla first. Anything that tastes so good's got to be good for you. <laughs> and I'm a huge fan of chocolate, so I definitely believe that chocolate and vanilla are just too good. So uh, yes, that's healthy. That's good. And uh, it's not a plant, though, that's easy to grow or a real controlled environment. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, but then but very tasty, tasty. And the people who do grow them value them a great deal uh, because it's a huge success to get them. The ones who cultivate them also prize them because they're, it's a connoisseur thing. It's like mm. good wines, good, good chocolates, all good things. Um, the other thing that you said about Lungs? Yeah, lung diseases, lung diseases. and uh, coughs. Coughs. That they, um, they're very good for that. And uh -huh. actually, this is from the aroma, because I thought that orchids did not have any aroma. Is that true? No, oh, gosh, oh no, there's, oh, they, their first allure is by their looks. They're very architectural. But then they have that backup of fragrance, too. And some of the fragrance is just heaven. Mm. It's fabulous. So, and, and some people just uh, collect fragrant orchids. You could have a fabulous collection of orchids that are all very smelly. Um, <laughs> and that's got to be good for you, too. Uh, you know, aromatherapy. Right. So, um, yes, um, actually, that's what... If that's in your environment, I think that it would uh, uh, be beneficial. Right. Yeah. And then they look cool. I mean, if they're not beautiful, they're interesting. So all that uh, comes into play in making our environment and our well-being um, healthy. Right. Um, well, that's amazing that uh, um, the aromas, uh, mm -hmm. you know, would help us health-wise. Health now, a folktale we found that the origin of the orchid is from Greece and that uh, their original name is Orcus. Mm -hmm. Now Orcus, um, he was uh, the son of a nymph and a satyr, and um, uh, in the celebration of Bacchus, Bacchus is the god of uh, wine, mm -hmm. and um, uh, well, he, wa he, wanted to, he almost raped a priestess, and the gods punished him by sending wild beasts and destroying him. And from them, from there is where he was metamorphosized into a tall and thin plant, mm -hmm. which is, that's the origin that I found about orchids, mm -hmm. or orchis or orchid. Mm -hmm. um, and because it, it is, uh, in Greece, orchis means virility. And I, I, I do kind of think that because some of their orchids, they, uh -huh. they, they're very testicular. Yeah, and go with that. Now, um, 
the other folk tale that is that uh, they don't reflower, that orchids don't reflower. Is that true? Oh, I would is put that in with old wives' tales. Yes. You know, kind of like, oh, you know. Of course they rebloom. Otherwise, they would all be extinct. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, now we're going to get into the section we have from our fans about um, uh, the, how to take care of orchids. And um, Nancy Davis is going to demonstrate for us. Uh, our first question is, is going to be how to transplant an orchid. And she's mm -hmm. going to show us exactly how to transplant. I brought all these uh, parts. And uh, so if we could just get them all up here, then I'll start to make a mess out of your display. <laughs> OK, this is how we're going to do it. All right, this, um, let's see. Alrighty. The one thing that you have to start when you're gonna, that you have to keep in mind when you're repotting an orchid is to show no fear. All right. That's number one step. Number two step is to get a workplace that's um, neat, organized, and that you can make a mess in, uh, but will protect uh, your, the, your tabletops, whatever. So I've got this great pan. I think that this is something that was used, you could buy it at Home Depot, that is uh, something to store things under your bed. Right. It makes a great workspace. Um, so if, you're, uh, if you're, you have a limited space, this is a really good uh, uh, item to have. Tools of the trade. You know. Is I've got a lot of brothers, and I love I love to go in hardware stores. I'm always <laughs> looking for tools, so uh, these are um, some good ones to have uh, if you're uh, with any gardening. Yeah, uh, good pair of s s snippers, and then uh, then you're going to need the heavier duty cutter, and then saws. These are good Japanese saws. They're a bit expensive, but they really work. And I find that uh, if you have a good tool, then it makes the work go easier, and then it's more fun. So you're not struggling. OK, so what you do is you have your workplace, you get your tools, and then you're going to say, well, what am I going to repot? What's, uh, you know, what's on the agenda for today? And then you'll know what your potting medium is going to be. So I have brought some samples, and we can look. And then you can just ask me which ones you might. Right. Your, your um, I was going to say customers, your clients, <laughs> your, your, our your, fans. Your fans. Our fans Hello. on Facebook. <laughs> OK. <laughs> all right. So um, this is one that's, you see all this white stuff. Those right. are roots. Oh. And, uh, oh, yeah, that they're, needs to be repotted. It's wanting to be repotted. Yeah, yeah. this is a real classic. Uh, 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 example of needing to be repotted. Well, we've got this, and it, I look sometimes like I'm treating the plants rough, but I've worked with them for so long that my hands are used to working with them. So um, <clears throat> I have this guy. But then here's another one that's a classic problem plant that people uh, have questions about in the greenhouses. Uh, so I also brought that one. This one's called the moth orchid. So this is the one that you might get uh, at our gardens or at Trader Joe's, uh, all the little places around, um, even at the market, supermarkets, mm -hmm. they have it. Pretty common plant now. But again, you could see, uh, oh, I have one that's, uh, if you can grab that. The yellow one? No, the white one. So you can see the kind of like the before, what you would take home because it's gorgeous. And see, here's ah. the, this is the beautiful, the moth orchid. It was named the moth orchid because when it was first discovered, it was seen through binoculars. This is a good story. It was seen through binoculars. And uh, the flowers looked, they were just moving in the wind. And so it looked like um, uh, shimmering um, uh, butterflies. Ah. But then when the, the plantsmen got closer, they discovered that it was actually a beautiful flower. So it's nicknamed the moth orchid. So this is what we usually have. We take home, we enjoy, and then it turns into this. Right. And then we're you know, all upset. We go, gee, what happened? I killed it. This is a natural process. The flowers 
are gorgeous. They do last a long time on orchids, which is one of their uh, strong points, is that you can have a flower that will last not one week, two weeks, three weeks, but many times four weeks to five, six, eight weeks. I even have some people who say these orchids have flowered for them in their homes for months. Yes. Yeah. So it's a really hardy plant. But sometimes it needs to be repotted. Right. So so what type of bark do we use? Because we do have, uh, is it a special bark? Um, well, you want to just use bark that's clean and not full of debris and dust. Uh, so therefore, the bark that's uh, uh, sold for uh, outside in the landscape is not suitable. It's too big, it's too chunky, and it's got a bunch of dust and yucky stuff in it. So you want to try and get a clean bark. Okay. These two plants um, both use bark, and all orchid, almost all orchids, I can't say all, but almost all orchids use the bark because their roots are real fat and thick and fibrous. And if you put that kind of, here's one here, if you put this kind of a root in soil, it suffocates it. And so if any of your fans have just repotted their orchid into soil, take it out. It's much better to be with nothing than in soil because you will, it, it'll just die. Mm. So I've taken the pot off and so you can see these nice big flat, fat, fleshy roots. And um, usually I wear gloves. I'm not going to do that today, but usually it's a good idea to wear gloves just to keep your hands clean. Uh, but So if your plant came like this, what you want to do is get the planting stick out so you don't poke your eye out with it. So we just get rid of that. If the blooms have already fallen off, you can do one of two things. You can follow the notches and cut it above a stem that you think is going to bloom again. In this case, it's not, so cut it back down again. And then get rid of this one, which is also bloomed. So we're going to cut that. So this is still got plenty of cell structure. And the plants, as we will go back to the sexy stuff, the plants really like to bloom. Yeah. They feel good blooming. So if they think that their bloom has been you know, stopped and they still have enough of this nice green stem left, they'll start thinking that, hmm, I need to bloom again. So with all of this stem already developed, you get a faster rebloom. Mm. You can trick them most of the time, but not all the time. Right. So if it's this start, stem starts to fade back, then just go ahead and cut it all the way down, like that. Then, see how nice this little tray is? It yes. All this. A lot of the orchids now, we're, we're going to re, I'll replant the um, moth orchid. A lot of the ones that are on the market today come planted in this moss. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. This moss only is good for one year, and then it starts to decompose. So chances are the orchid that you've got has been in the container, the uh, commercial grown container and moss for about at least six months. So you've got about six months before your potting medium is just going to be no good. Mm -hmm. If you leave it in that potting medium longer than a year, it starts to decompose. Then it starts to turn into something that's like soil. And then remember, we know soil is too dense, so it starts to suffocate the roots. The same thing happens with this stuff. And then we think it's our fault, we don't have a green thumb, but in fact, no, 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 it's really just this, this old moss. <coughs> so the moss is great, but only short-lived. So you remove the moss. <coughs> I'm going to start coughing, so I'm going to get some water. But we remove the moss. Can you see that? Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yes. All right. All right. See? And if you notice that, get rid of the moss, the roots are 
almost like it's empty on the inside and then the roots are all on the outside. That's because when these roots grow, they're amazing. In their natural habitat, they would be growing along, say, a tree branch. And so they'd be kind of like, pretend my arm is a tree branch, they would be growing kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And then the root system would just hold on. And so the root system, as it grows, it has a growing tip. And then on healthy roots, you'll see that little green tip on the outside. So anyway, so they are not an aggressive root system, and they do like to be near the security of the edge of the pot. So, this pot, if we put the plant in it, you can see that it would be too much of a distance right. from the root from the side of the pot. So, this is too big. I usually put some bark down in the center of the plant and then kind of hold it like you're doing a, a ponytail kind of. And then I place it centered in the pot and then I'll take, <clears throat> a little difficult here, but then I'm taking more of the bark. So it's not rocket science. We're right. just sort of like getting the roots in and uh, then taking these chunky barks and sort of filling the space in that the roots left. See how I'm just tapping it to settle them down. Now, it's, yeah, it's nice and loose. <laughs> it's got air, but it's got fresh bark. That'll be good for, say, we'll turn it like this, for um, two years with good fresh bark. Ta-da, that's it. Wow. Mm -hmm. And now, how about the watering? How, water, how, is it better to water th uh, in the sitting position? Mm -hmm. or uh, Because there should be no direct water, right? Um, no, uh, if the plants are outside, then you want to be careful of water sitting on the leaves, especially these fleshy ones, because they can make a virus attack the leaves. But inside the home, that water is going to dry up pretty fast. Uh, so you can get the leaves wet. It's actually better to keep the, to, to wet the leaves when you water it, because then you're washing the leaves and they don't get that dust accumulate on their, uh, on the foliage so they can breathe. Right. Uh, so you want to put them, say, take them to a kitchen sink or a service sink so water can trickle down, say, through the leaves and um, through the roots and bark and just drain out about, say, five minutes, no longer. Then after that, you're going to put some plant food on it that you have pre-mixed and you keep it in a real handy space and you just pull it out and then pour some of your plant food over it. They love to be fed. And how often? I recommend that we water our plants and then we feed them. And then when the full moon comes out, you don't feed them that, that week. Oh. Okay. Interesting. That's another tale for Yes, you. another tale. I love it. Well, yes. Nancy, thank you so much for, for all this show and tell here. You're welcome. Um, we definitely have to go back to Shell Dance Nursery for some more. Uh, oh, that would be nice. Emphasis on bromeliads and oh, all yeah. those other yeah. beautiful yeah. exotic uh -huh. plants. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank Kane Colby for his questions. Uh, I want to thank Nancy for coming out and bringing out all her beautiful orchids. Uh, befriend us on Facebook. Oh, Send yeah. us those questions. We mm -hmm. need it. And mm -hmm. uh, Shell Dance Nursery is also open for de educational tours and private events. Um, if you Graduation parties, weddings, mm -hmm. they're open for that. Thank you for joining us. And uh, happy gardening. I like this. What's the dance to? Yeah, dance kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a <laughs> Give me five. <laughs>